Okay, it's now um, three o'clock in the afternoon, our time. Um, and um, this is a Ottawa Forum in Israel Palestine presentation on a very live question, and that is whether or not it's fair to call the state of Israel a parliamentary, uh, an apartheid state, or whether in fact it's a liberal parliamentary democracy, as some people say, or whether it's something else altogether. Next slide. Um, our agenda today is we're starting now. Uh, I'll spend about 10 minutes, eight or 10 minutes of introductions, welcoming people. And uh, then we will have an interview with Jonathan Cook, who is a British Israeli journalist and author. Uh, after that, there'll be a question and answer period. You'll be invited to put your questions in the question and answer box, um, or uh, you can uh, raise your hand and we will take a couple of questions uh, live by hand if we have the time and are able to do so, as long as those questions uh, or points uh, are done in a fairly economical short time, so we're not taking up too much time and it can allow different people to raise their issues. Um, I will be particularly interested in people who disagree. Uh, it, we, 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 we don't particularly need more help from people who agree. We need people who are uh, either not sure or, or in disagreement. So I encourage those people to speak up or to write in the uh, question and answer box. Um, then uh, afterwards, we oh, and you can use the chat function is open. You can use that to communicate either with the panelists or with other people. That's fine. We won't be paying attention to it though in terms of question and answer. So if you have a question and answer, please put it in the question and answer box. And we plan to adjourn in an hour and 15 minutes from now. To draw your attention to that, this is one of an ongoing series of OFEP educational webinars. The next one will be on May 10th, and we'll be dealing with the ongoing NACPA. And our uh, guest will be um, Lubna Shomali, who is with Badil, which is the Palestinian organization, the organization for Palestinian refugees. Next slide. So you will all be aware of the fact that until very recently, uh, Amnesty International came out with a report calling Israel an apartheid state. And uh, what was new about uh, the Amnesty's report was that it not only said that uh, Israel was practicing apartheid in the West Bank, it said that Israel was actually practicing apartheid inside the state of Israel itself. This uh, raised the hackles of many organizations, including many Jewish, liberal Jewish organizations, Here's part, part from a press release from the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs, which claimed that that report demonizes Israel, amounts to an anti-Semitic and diatribe. It uses over the top and wildly inaccurate rhetoric. It obviously got people's um, dander up. Next slide. Now, about the state of Israel, there are two conflicting narratives. One narrative, when we hear from Justin Trudeau and from many uh, from the Israeli government, is that Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. The counter narrative, articulated for a long time by many Palestinians, and most recently by Amnesty International, is that Israel's policies across all the territories it controls clearly amount to apartheid. Now, it, it, democracy or apartheid, it cannot be, it cannot both be true, isn't that right? Well, actually, I would like to make the point today that it is possible for both things to be true at the same time. And while that seems contradictory, I draw your attention to, for example, ancient Greece, which is supposed to be the font of, of our Western democracy. But we all know that in ancient Greece, 40% of its population were slaves. None of the women had the right to vote. So while the, the, the Greek men may have thought that Greece was a wonderful democracy, uh, probably 50 or 60 or 70% of its population didn't think so. Coming closer in time and territory, you could say the same thing at the United States. When it was founded, Europeans went to the United States to examine the marvel of American democracy. And compared to European kings, kingdoms, it was. They elected a president. A president could be defeated. There, were, um, there was universal suffrage for the people who were citizens of the state of the United States. But of course, at the same time, there were um, millions and millions of slaves who were not considered citizens. And at the same time, uh, that the, the democracy of the United States was killing and driving Aboriginal people out. So the United States was a democracy in one sense, but the opposite of a democracy in another sense. 
And so I say, when we're talking about Israel, we need to respect and understand the aspects of it, which is it, which are democratic, and understand the aspects of it, which are less so. Next slide. Now, just a quick reminder, um, um, many of the people on this, the call today will be already well aware of this, but perhaps not everybody is. Um, uh, we're talking about in Israel, a population of approximately 9.2 million people. Now, when I say Israel, I'm talking about the purple area in, on the map. Um, that those are the borders of Israel, uh, or Palestinians would call the occupation of 48, as opposed to the occupation of 67, which would be the yellow marks, West Bank and Gaza. Uh, of the people living inside uh, Israel, um, about um, one and a half million or so are, are, are Palestinians. But Palestinians also live in the West Bank, they live in Jerusalem, they live in Gaza, and they live in refugee states. Uh, refugee uh, camps in Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, and so on. Now, there is a hierarchy. Uh, the, the, the Palestinians who live in Israel are undeniably the ones with the most rights. They have more rights than the Palestinians living in Jerusalem. They have more rights than the Palestinians living in the West Bank. And, they, and, and certainly they have more rights than the Palestinians cooped up in an outdoor prison that's Gaza, and more rights than those who are trapped in refugee camps. Today, we're only going to talk about the situation of those Palestinians who live inside the state of Israel, or, or we're going to talk about the state of Israel and how it treats those Palestinians. Next slide. Now, I'm going to say a number of things here that could easily come from uh, Israeli propaganda, but which I think are largely true, and which I think we have to understand and accept if we're going to have a well-rounded uh, understanding of the issue. Israel today is a booming high-tech modern European type economy. Its GDP per person is approximately 32,000, makes it like Spain or Italy, a little bit less than Canada. Next slide. So, so to, um, Israel, as we all know, is a popular tourist destination. There are about, according to the least, recent statistics prior to COVID, about 50,000 Canadians go to Israel every year. A large percent of them, percentage are Jews. There's another a chunk of people who are Christian pilgrims. And then there's a few backpacking kind of tourists as well, going to its, its famed beaches and so on. Next slide. Israel has many characteristics of other liberal democratic countries. And it's important to recognize it. For example, it has regular elections. It has universal suffrage. Everybody can vote. Palestinians, Palestinian citizens of Israel, as well as Jewish citizens of Israel can vote. There is free public education for everybody. There is an independent press, although with Jonathan, we may talk a little bit about the parameters of that independence. It has an independent judiciary, a Supreme Court. The Israeli military is under civil authority uh, and it has freedom of speech. And you can see there the seat distribution in the uh, Knesset, which today even includes an Arab Palestinian party, the Ram party. Next slide. Israel's population is diverse. About 40% of its population are Ashkenazi Jews. Another 40 or so are Misrazi. Ashkenazi Jews come from Europe. Misrazi or Sephardic Jews come from uh, the Middle East or yeah, the Middle East, we'll say that. About 20% of its population are Palestinian citizens of Israel. And there's approximately 2% are Druze. Next slide. But in terms of its overall ethnic pop, pop, pop composition, about three quarters of the population is Jewish and about 25% are, um, are Arab. So that's the overall ethnic composition of the state of Israel today. Next slide. Now let's take a look at the status of the Palestinian citizens of Israel. Israel prefers to call them Arab Israelis. Uh, we, we can discuss that later on why that is the case, but. Um, these are the people who did, did not get expelled in 1947-48, remained in Israel. They constitute about 20% of Israelis, Israel's population today. They are citizens of Israel. That means they have a passport. They have the right to vote. They're representing the Knesset. They get free state-supplied education from K to 12. The Palestinian citizens of Israel get to elect their own mayors of towns and villages. They're eligible to be elected to the Supreme Court, and sometimes they are. They own their own houses, or can own their own houses. 
Inside Israel, Arabic is recognized as a special language. Uh, there is religious freedom. There are both churches and mosques in Israel. You can travel around and you see mosques in many places. Um, you can, uh, a Palestinian citizen of Israel can travel anywhere they want in Israel. And this is very important, and I want to come back and discuss this one with Jonathan afterwards. Surveys do show that the Palestinian citizens of Israel prefer to live in Israel over moving to the uh, occupied um, Palestinian territories or moving to Jordan or moving to Egypt. Next slide. Furthermore, as citizens of Israel, the Palestinian citizens can travel wherever they want. They can shop at the same stores, go to the same beaches. They can eat in the same restaurants as Jewish Israelis, and they do, and they get to go to the same universities. There are no Palestinian or Arab universities in Israel. They're all Israeli uh, Hebrew language universities. Yes, next slide. And equality is even in Israel's Declaration of Independence, which says that the state of Israel will affirm complete social and equality, social and political equality for all its citizens. Um, regardless of religion, race, or gender. Next slide. As a matter of fact, in Israel, as in Canada, Israeli citizens have the right to protest and even demand the resignation of the leader. We know there was a huge movement against um, Bibi. There is a small movement against uh, Mr. Trudeau, but in Canada, uh, demonstrations happen and prime ministers are dumped as they are in Israel as well. Next slide. So, when you look at all this, does that sound like apartheid? It sounds to me and to most people like a pretty normal liberal democracy. And on that basis, why would Amnesty International or anybody else claim that Israel is an apartheid state? Is it out of ignorance? Is it out of anti-Semitism, stupidity, maliciousness? And it poses the question, is Israel really a liberal democracy? Is it apartheid state or is it something else? Remember, we're not talking about the West Bank. We're not talking about Gaza. We're talking about the Palestinian citizens of Israel. We're talking about the state of Israel itself. And to this end, I'm going to turn to Jonathan Cook. Next slide. So Jonathan is an award-winning British-Israeli journalist. He moved to Israel in 2001. That's 20 years ago. He became an Israeli citizen. He ended up marrying a Palestinian citizen of Israel and having two young children who, li who live with him there in Nazareth. He now splits his time between Nazareth and Bristol in the UK. He's an award-winning journal journalist. His articles appeared in The Guardian, The Observer, International Herald Tribune, and so on. And he has been a senior consultant to, to the International Crisis Group. Next slide. Jonathan is the author of three books about the Israel-Palestine situation, including Blood and Religion, Israel and the Class of Civilization, Disappearing Palestine, and he, he writes a regular blog, Jonathan Cook, The View from Nazareth. So Jonathan, if you can light up your screen and if uh, you can stop sharing, um, there we go. Jonathan, welcome. Hello, hi Peter, glad John to be here. Yeah, Jonathan, thank, thanks so much. And we're hoping that um, you, over the course of the next hour or so, you can help us better understand um, um, if whether or not those statements are true or if they are true but qualified in some way, in a way that help us deepen our understanding of what is the situation of Palestinian citizens of Israel. And maybe I'll start, Jonathan, with um, the one I sort of ended up with in my presentation. And that is, I often get referred to the fact that um, uh, Israel has this uh, Declaration of Independence which is quite clear, quite modern uh, declaration about equality. And um, I sometimes I'm told, how can you possibly be using words like apartheid? And by the way, I'm not trying to convince people here that Israel is an apartheid. So you can come to your own conclusion. I'm talking about whether or not it, how closely it resembles the liberal democratic model um, that, is, that is held out. So what about this declaration of independence? Isn't that proof in itself that um, <clears throat> Israel is a liberal democratic society? Well, I suppose it might be if it had actually been implemented. I think, in a sense, the Declaration of Independence gives us a clue as to the problems for Israel, because for the last, well, ever since Israel was created, since that Declaration of Independence was, was, was produced, Israel has been trying to draft a constitution. 
and it's failed more than seven decades. It's been unable to draft a constitution. In fact, back when I first arrived in Israel, they, they'd set up yet again a, a con, what they called a constitutional committee to try and draft a, commi- a, a, a constitution. And it ran into the ground as all the other efforts to do so ha- ha- has happened in each occasion when they've tried to do this. And there was a simple reason why they couldn't draw up a constitution, which is they got stuck yet again on the idea of equality. There is no way they can enshrine equality in an Israeli constitution. They can have it in their Declaration of Independence. Sure, it's uh, an aspiration, if you like, in the uh, Declaration of Independence. But when it comes to drafting a constitution that would have legal definition, it would apply, it would be the overarching principle by which uh, Israeli laws would be interpreted, uh, would help the Supreme Court determine how to interpret laws. Israel, the politicians have always um, stalled at the point of drafting that constitution, and it's been the problem has been about equality. So you you find no piece of legislation in Israel uh, that embodies, enshrines the idea of equality, that the best effort they had at trying to create a Bill of Rights was back in 1992, um, with a basic law on human dignity. And even there, uh, there is no principle of equality. So this has become one of the the, the key um, roadblocks in the Israeli constitutional process, is this idea of how do you enshrine equality without giving equal rights to Palestinian citizens of Israel, primarily. That's the the main problem here. If there was a principle. Yeah. Isn't, isn't it true that the when the Supreme Court, various Adala and others take debates to the Supreme Court, that reference is made to the Declaration of Independence? Is that, am I wrong there? Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, Adala, of course, if you're trying to get uh, recognition of equal rights, you, the, the only thing you can do is appeal to the Declaration of Independence. But the problem is there isn't a piece of legislation embodying that. So it, again, as I say, it's just an aspiration. But in practice, it has no legal, you can't enforce it. That's why um, academics like uh, Israeli Jewish academics, like Oren Yiftekel, uh, he wrote famously wrote a book called Ethnocracy, and he defines Israel as one of a rare number of, of countries that, he, uh, that he, he calls them ethnocracies because they have the facade of a democracy, but they're essentially uh, ethnic states, states which are privileging one group based on, based on its uh, the fact that it has an ethnic status. So here we get to the core of the problem for Israel. Um, how do you square that circle of being Jewish and democratic? You, you can't do that if you enshrine the principle of, uh, of equality, which is why Israel has failed to do that. You, you have to look at it and say, what does Jewish mean? The, the core principle in this, uh, that, that law I referred to before the 1992 human dignity, basic law, um, it states that Israel is a Jewish and democratic state. So what does that mean? What does it mean to be Jewish and democratic? What do you mean by Jewish in the, those circumstances? You could mean it in, um, in, the, in the sense of being members of the Jewish religion. Well, given that a significant part of your population are not Jewish, uh, don't identify as religiously Jewish, and a, a fair section of your Jewish population um, also don't consider themselves to be religiously Jew- Jewish, you have a problem there. You can't be democratic. You can't have equality at that level. And you can't do it if you mean it uh, in an ethnic way, because, again, you have a Palestinian uh, minority which don't okay. qualify. So Israel has tended to blur this and talk about Jewish meaning a nationality, which we, which we can get to later. But this is a very fudged idea. Famously, one, one Supreme Court judge said Israel is Jewish in the same way that France is French. Um, well, you can instantly see there's a problem there. You can't define Jewish in the same way that France defines French. So you get into these, why, these why legal not? hurdles why and not? Israel's never got over them. Why not? Well, because, because you don't convert to being French. You, you can naturalize as French. You live in France and you go through a naturalization process. But you and can't you be a, do that be to become non-Jewish. Jewish. It doesn't yeah. work that way. Right. Okay. Um, Jonathan, another, just to, to summarize on that, that point is that there, this uh, aspirational declaration exists, but it doesn't have any teeth. It's not, it's not something that actually uh people can lean on is that is that, is that so let's just take another brief example yeah in 2018 yusuf jabarin who's a knesset member uh, uh, for one of the palestinian parties inside israel 
he tried to introduce um, an alternative basic law. Israel has these basic laws, which are sort of supposed to be like a constitution, but and they were all supposed to be brought together into a constitution, but they never have been because of this problem of equality. And he introduced an alternative basic law, Israel as a de democratic, egalitarian and multicultural state. And he couldn't find a single Jewish Knesset member to support him. Mm. There are 120 Knesset members, roughly 100 of them are Jewish. Not one, not even the left ones would support him on that because it, it gets to the core of what is Israel. It's a Jewish state. It's not there to be a, a state giving equality to all the citizens. It's there to embody all those Jew Jewish values and represent enshrine privilege for the Jewish citizens of the state. I mean, this is a huge topic and we'd need to attack it from various different angles to understand it. But just to, to because we're talking about the Declaration of Independence, I just want to make it clear that this, despite being an aspiration, in practice, it has no weight, no legal weight. Um, I want to talk a bit, since we're talking about the, the Yosef Jabarin, who's been to Canada and being in the Knesset, there's a question from Rick Kohler um, about that issue. Um, clearly, uh, Arabs are uh, elected to the Knesset. And Rick, do you want to, uh, can, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? There we go. Thanks very much, Jonathan, for this presentation. The question I have uh, relates to uh, universal suffrage. Mm. If our Arabs have in universal subject uh, suffrage can be elected to the Knesset, sometimes are even judges and diplomats, how can one in, in imply that they are contained in an apartheid state? Well, let, let's let's look at it a different way. Let's try and t think about it in a slightly different way. Let's think about the first 20 years when Israel has just been created and, and it's deciding whether it's going to give the vote to these new Palestinian citizens it's inherited very uncomfortably. It doesn't really want them there. It's expelled most Palestinians, but this is rump Palestinian population it hasn't managed to get rid of them. And it decides right from the beginning, the first Knesset election is 1949. It gives those Palestinian citizens, a small number of them, it gives them the vote. They have a vote. But at the same time, for the next 20 years, they're living under a military government. They can't leave their communities without a permit from a military governor. They have very, very limited rights. In fact, one of the few rights they have is the right to vote. Would we want to say that, therefore, because they have a right to vote, even though they can't leave their village or their town without a piece of paper from a military governor allowing them to do that? They can't attend a wedding. They can't go and get a job. They can't get to their fields to farm. They can't do anything without the military governor saying, yes, you can do it. Would we want to say that that was a democracy? Would we want to say it's a liberal democracy? I mean, if we take the principle that you're implying, well, because they have the vote, therefore it's a democracy. Well, then it was, even though they're living under military government, martial law. So clearly you need more than simply having the vote to, to, for, for a state to be a democracy, particularly a liberal democracy. Um, the argument I'm making here is Israel lacks those things, those extra things. It is uh, a necessary condition to be a democracy, but it isn't. It's far from being a sufficient one. And in this example, Asad Ranam, a, a Palestinian academic in, in Israel, he calls the vote window dressing. That's his view of it. He says, well, we're given the vote because it makes it, Israel look like a democracy and it makes everybody around the world think we're, it's a democracy because everybody's got the vote. But in practice, because we're twenty percent of the population, you also have to think about. I mean, many people here probably are aware of the term gerrymandering, and this came from this guy who gerrymander who who fixed the boundaries of constituencies to ensure that he got elected and, and his competitor didn't. In, in essence, what Israel did in 1948 was a huge exercise in gerrymandering. So it expelled the vast majority of Palestinians, and then had a tiny rump Palestinian population left, and then said, "Well, we'll give them the vote." Yeah, but you, you've, you've gerrymandered the whole district to make sure that the Jewish population will, will always be able to outvote the Palestinian population. And so this whole, there's been a demographic war against Palestinian citizens of Israel ever since. They've had the vote, but Israeli Jews are voting tribally for Jewish privileges. As I've explained already, there's, there's no principle of equality. So the whole thing is, is set up to deny equality, to ensure and maintain Jewish privilege within all systems of, uh, of life. And so the fact that Palestinians get to vote on that once every four or five years, or more often recently with the problems that they have forming a government, 
doesn't mean that Israel is a democracy or liberal democracy. It just means Palestinians get a right to vote uh, and then get ignored that what their vote it has no contributes nothing. Um, and that's why there's a huge disenchantment. The, the voting rate has fallen and fallen and fallen. Um, we, 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 we ha it, there's also another problem in this, which, which we should tackle too, which is to, to stand for the Knesset, if you're a Palestinian uh, party, you have to sign up to Israel as a Jewish state, Jewish and democratic state. You have to say it is a Jewish and democratic state, even though I can tell you not one of those parties really believes that, not one of them. But if they didn't uh, sign up to that, they wouldn't be allowed to stand for the Knesset. So the, the system is even ideologically rigged so that they can't really express their true, true opinions. Well, Jonathan, and every you, few Jonathan, years, are, are you saying yeah. that there are um, there are qualifications to who can who can run in the in the what parties? Can yeah, run sure, in the sure. I mean, Israel Israel has throughout its history banned Palestinian parties of Palestinian citizens. It didn't like um, usually ones that were asking for equality. I mean, really asking for equality. Um, you can go right back to the earliest years, um, the al ard party, and that was going on. You can see it more recently. Um, we're talking only a few years ago when the Northern Islamic movement was banned um, officially because it, would, it had um, terrorist connections to Hamas. That was the official story, although we know that's not true. That's Netanyahu's story. Um, but we know from investigations by the Israeli media that when the Shin Bet was asked um, should the Northern Islamic movement be banned? Uh, the Shin Bet said they could find no connections. So we know that they didn't find those connections, and the Shin Bet has very good information and intelligence on Palestinian society. But Netanyahu and the Israeli right were looking for a pretext to ban the Northern Islamic movement. Why? Because the Northern Islamic movement didn't accept the legitimacy of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state, it said it wasn't a Jewish and democratic state. So any party that speaks like this is in danger of getting banned and they certainly can't stand for the Knesset. So, so the parties that are there representing Palestinian minority don't really represent them because they don't really say what they believe and they don't really say what Palestinians in Israel believe. The vast majority of Palestinians in Israel don't really think Israel is a Jewish and democratic state, but th there's nobody who can represent them uh, legitimately saying that. So, so on that level, there's a real problem here as well. Um, let's leave the um, Knesset aside for the moment, if you wouldn't mind, and move on to another area. There have been a couple of questions raised in the Q&A about um, education. Um, I said, and I believe it's true in my introduction, that every um, citizen of Israel, um, Palestinian or Jewish, gets free state education from K to 12. Um, doesn't that sort of imply, mean a certain amount of equality? Is that is that that's so that's far away from the kind of um, uh, apartheid that we were thinking of in South, America, uh, South Africa, for example, where the blacks didn't have any schools whatsoever. Um, what do you say about that? Well, you, uh, you, I, I don't want to uh, channel this too much into the question of apartheid. You, you suggested we look at this more in terms of whether Israel is a liberal democracy. Uh, but if we wanted to look at something uh, that I think most of us would accept was similar to apartheid, which would be Jim Crow in the US, you had segregated schools. And famously in 1954, the, the US Supreme Court ruled that separate was inherently unequal. You couldn't have equality if people were being educated in segregated schools. Well, that's exactly what we have in Israel. There's always been segregated schools in Israel. Um, Israel has tried to justify this on the grounds that it is um, protecting, or it hasn't actually even said this, it sort of implies that it's protecting the Arabic language by having segregated schools, uh, Arab state education system for the Palestinian minority, and a various different streams of Hebrew education for the Jewish population. So you have entirely segregated education in Israel, uh, it's so segregated. I mean, Israel rationalizes this and says, well, Palestinians live in their own communities, and we haven't got to the question of, of residential segregation, which is a whole big other issue which we need to get to. But they'll say, well, the reason that Palestinians need their own separate schools is because they're living in, se in separate communities, their own Palestinian communities, and therefore those schools represent them in those communities. And Jews are living in different communities, and their schools represent them in their language. But actually, we know that's a nonsense uh, from 
I mean, it's a terrible principle anyway, but even if it weren't, we know it's not really true because there are examples where Palestinians live in communities alongside the Jewish population. Again, we need to talk about this because there's still segregation going on, on there. And what, what Israel calls the mixed cities, but not really mixed. They're segregated. Palestinians living in uh, ghetto-like conditions within those mixed cities. Um, but where you have, for instance, Nazareth elite, right next to where I was living uh, in Nazareth, uh, you had a mixed population, about 30 to 35 percent of Nazareth elite's population are Palestinian citizens of Israel. But the mayor is Jewish and he has always denied the right to build a single school, even though there are thousands of, of Palestinian children in his community. He's denied the right for a Palestinian school to, to, to operate there. He wants an entirely Hebrew education system and he won't allow the, the Palestinian children in his city to go to a, a Hebrew school, even if they want to. He wants segregated education, even though he lives in a, what, what's called a mixed city. So this is a very strong principle in the Israeli education system, segregation. And, and Jonathan, just to be clear, um, there's no, no legal inhibition to doing that. He can do that. That's his right to do so. There's not, it doesn't contravene any... Well, uh, go ahead. Well, it, under the education law, he has to, he ha actually by law, he has to provide uh, a school for his Palestinian children, ch Palestinian children in his community. He's breaking the law. No, nobody's doing anything about it. What I should point out, it's gone to court several times. Israeli Jewish human rights groups have been challenging this. Groups like ACRI have been taking Nazareth elite to the courts and the courts have not done anything about it, which is another problem with the judiciary. Well, that's a, a whole big other story too, but it, he is breaking the law. But he isn't. But nothing. He's not being held to account for it. So, in fact, all those children <clears throat> at the moment are having to go to Nazareth and a burden on the Nazareth school school system uh, because because uh, Nazareth really won't take its responsibilities seriously. I haven't also got to the point though, about the education system, which is yes, it's segregated, and uh, as that U.S. Supreme Court ruling said, separate is inherently unequal, which is certainly true. But actually, it's not just a, a, unequal in a kind of uh, abstract sense, in a very practical sense. Those Arab schools are m in much worse condition than the Jewish schools. They're massively underfunded. They get a, a fraction of what the Jewish schools get. There are thousands of classrooms, shortage of classrooms in, in the Palestinian sector of the education system. Uh, Palestinians have no control over their curriculum. It's all set by Jewish officials. So that idea that they're somehow preserving their own culture uh, and language is undermined by the fact they have no control over their education system. Jewish officials have control of it. And historically, Israel has used the secret police, the Shin Bet, to determine who can serve as uh, teachers, head teachers in those schools. So they're controlling the supply of teachers. There's a huge surveillance system historically in Palestinian schools to make sure that nothing nationalistic or any historical information will be provided to Palestinians. And you can also see that in the Nakba law, <clears throat> which was passed in 2011. Nakba being the, the catastrophe for Palestinians, the loss of their homeland in 1948, when it becomes a Jewish state instead. Um, Israel passed this law in 2011, which means that any public institution, universities, schools, libraries, anything like that, that commemorates or acknowledges the Nakba in any way will lose its public funding. So they can't even talk about their history. So there are all sorts of problems with the, the education system. Uh, the segregation and and control over it. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Jerry Wright to raise a question that has to do with education. But before I do so, I want to remind people that uh, I really am serious when I say I'd like to encourage people who think that we are here making a too harsh criticism of Israel. Please feel free to speak up, either in the Q and A written down or raising your hand, um, because I think there are um, I know there are people out there who who will be. Uh, disagreeing with us or Jonathan, and I'd like to hear your voices as well. Um, Jerry, would you like to explain your 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 point it has to do with education? Can you unmute yourself or can um, Yasmin, can you un unmute him? I'll I'll read it if we're not able to make a connection in a second or two. Okay, I'm not sure what's happening here. So the question, I'm reading this question from Jerry Wright. Um, I believe that Palestinians can be here. Are you there, Jerry? Yeah, I'm, I, I, I just unmuted. Okay, please give your question, go ahead. 
Well, um, my, I, I know you don't want Mr. Cook to uh, make uh, the term apartheid the center of this discussion, but the fact is it is central to uh, much of the debate and uh, analysis today. And I'm worried that it really gels attitudes uh, and gels prejudices and is not a really very constructive uh, uh, contribution if you're trying to look to ways to alleviate, to improve uh, the situation. And specifically, uh, I, uh, I look at, the, for example, the Palestinian complaint about uh, something like uh, psychometric testing um, as part of the university admissions process, testing that uh, uh, assesses uh, personality, uh, cognitive ability, and so forth. Uh, how will, will Palestinians uh, play a leading role in, in Israeli society if they don't measure up to standardized tests like this? Uh, are we right to call this kind of thing a case of, of deliberate discrimination against Palestinians on the part of Israeli Jews? Or is it possible that this kind of complaint uh, really arises out of uh, cultural differences or, or possibly even Palestinian self-pity, which I think is, um, uh, is entrenched by the use of terms like apartheid? Okay, well, the psychometric tests are, are an interesting aspect of uh, admissions from, so we move from segregated <coughs> education at, at what I would call secondary level, uh, the, the school years up to, to 18, uh, till, till pupils matriculate. So it's segregated with massive underfunding for Palestinian schools. And then you get to higher education where there isn't segregation. Um, and you could argue that what happens there is that there are further obstacles put in the way of Palestinian students to make it harder for them to get to university. Historically, that's certainly been the case. You go back the first 20, 30, 40 years in Israel, it was almost impossible for Palestinians, unless they were a, a, a genius to get into the uh, Israeli universities. And, and many of them went abroad. The, what, one of the reasons you could argue that Palestinian citizens of Israel have often favored the communist party isn't because they're all communists, because it was the only way they could get to university. You could do it through a communist scholarship and many went to eastern europe and hungary and other places russia um, why you find so many of them speaking those eastern european languages today the older people because that's the only place they could go to get a university education and in fact today you still see it with many palestinian students in israel <coughs> aren't actually studying in israel they're studying in the west bank or in jordan because it's so difficult for them to get to israeli universities now one of the ways it's been made hard for them is precisely the issue you've just raised the psychometric tests where they typically score 100 points less than Jewish students. Now you're suggesting, well, maybe that's just a cultural difference. Well, if it is a cultural difference, that's not a very standardized test then. Uh, and that would, be a, would, would suggest there's a problem with the test uh, at that level. In some sense, it's been engineered. But actually, we got a very good idea of what the psychometric tests are there to do a few years ago. Well, well, I say a few years ago. To me, it feels like a few years ago. It's probably more than 10 years ago now. But there was uh, a decision taken to scrap the psychometric test and do it based purely on the results that people got in their matriculations. And there was a reason it was done, uh, as we later found out, which was because there, there was an influx of what are called in Israel the Russian community, people who came to Jews who came to Israel or semi-Jews who came to Israel after the fall of the Soviet Union. And they were struggling with a psychometric test. And so Israel decided to scrap it and do it based on the scores in the matriculation. And what happened is Palestinian numbers of students getting to university places rocketed that year. In fact, they, they, did, they almost doubled the number of pupils they got, got into the universities. Didn't help the Russian community very much, but it did help the Palestinian citizens of Israel a great deal. So what did Israel do? It instantly reintroduced the psychometric tests because that wasn't what the plan was. The plan wasn't to let more Palestinians get into universities. It was there always to stop them getting in. And it was one of those unintended consequences that in trying to help the, the, the Russian speakers, it ended up help, helping the Palestinian students instead. And so Israel reintroduced it. It was a very clear example. Even some is uh, the more liberal members of the Israeli media had to admit that this was rigged, the system was rigged, and this was the proof of it. So actually, I think the psychometric tests prove, prove that point rather well. Jerry, do you want to comment on that, or should we leave it? Well, I, I, I guess my general point uh, was, was whether or not the use of terms like apartheid is, is constructive in this kind of context. And uh, 
I, I thought the psychometric test was an example of a situation where there was a standardized test and, and uh, Palestinians, surely the, 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 um, the remedy or a remedy, the best remedy for this kind of situation is, is if the Palestinians are capable <clears throat> of pulling themselves up by their own bootstraps. And uh, isn't this a good example of where they, uh, they might be discouraged from doing that? I mean, I, I've just got a, a nice um, anecdote that I was once told by Hassan Jabarin, who is one of the most important Palestinian lawyers inside Israel, who was talking about to me one, one evening about this, his experiences of the psychometric test. And there was a question on Eisen, uh, Einstein, which he answered on the assumption it was the famous Einstein scientist. And it turned out it was a reference to the uh, Jewish rock band Einstein, which he didn't know about. And there, there's a classic example of how cultural differences can, can go against you, even on what, what we're talking about as a standardized test. Well, it wasn't very standardized unless you knew about Jewish rock bands. But uh, also, I, I, just to make a more general point uh, about addressing what you're saying, um, if we want to talk about effectiveness, well, we've had decades of not calling Israel an apartheid state, including in the occupied territories, where obviously it is, but we haven't, we've been, there's been huge reluctance to talk about Israel being an apartheid state inside its borders, its recognized borders. Um, and it's got, got us nowhere. It's got Palestinians nowhere anyway. Um, so I think you have to get to the point and say, well, what, what do we need to do? What do we need, what labels do we need to use here to move the debate onwards in a, in a, in a positive direction? Because it hasn't been going in a positive direction. It's been going in an extremely negative direction for Palestinians. So how does it help hanging on to formulas, language, which, is, which has had no effect whatsoever? I mean, it's not like it's a new thing we're talking about here. We've had decades and decades to name what's going on. And there's been a great deal of reluctance to do that. And the only people who've paid the price for that are Palestinians. So it's very easy for, for us to sit back and say, well, maybe we should just give it some more time. But we're not Palestinians. We're not the ones suffering. We're not the victims of this system. So. Palestinians want to call it apartheid, and I think we should be listening to what they want. Okay, thank you, <laughs> Jonathan. Then several people have raised questions about uh, discrimination inside Israeli society, various levels of, um, I don't know what, social class, acceptability of the Ashkenazi, the Mizrahi, um, and so on. Is there, um, every society has discrimination, including Canada, um, is there something um, specific about the nature of discrimination against uh, Palestinian citizens, or is this just of a piece with the fact that we also discriminate against indigenous people or discriminate against blacks and so on and so forth? Is it fair to point, point to Israel's discrimination and saying that it's somehow different? Yeah. So, well, I think that the most important point to make here is that when we talk about the discrimination, I mean, I, I, you know, I was raised in Britain. I know that the black community there, the Asian community there suffered discrimination. And that would be true in America with black population, Hispanic population and so on. So those kinds of discrimination are definitely going on. But there's an important difference from what's going on with Israel. And maybe one of the reasons that groups like Amnesty are using the term apartheid, which is that the discrimination in, in Western liberal democracies is going on informally, spontaneously, unofficially. When an official discriminates uh, against somebody on the based on the color of their skin, for instance, they're doing it in violation of legal codes, of administrative practices. When it happens in Israel, that is not the case at all. It's being done because it's, those officials are carrying out the law, they're implementing the law, they're supposed to discriminate. That's the point of it. That's, it's embedded in the laws. It's, uh, uh, many people here probably already know about the, the, the group Adala, the legal group Adala, and has made this point in relation to uh, the laws in Israel, that there are nearly 70 of them now, which explicitly discriminate based on whether you're a Jew or a non-Jew inside Israel, uh, independently of your citizenship. So there are a lot of these kinds of laws. Um, I think the important thing to try and understand about Israel is this idea that you'll hear Israeli officials saying, well, there's Palestinians in Israel, or Israeli Arabs as they will call them, are full citizens of Israel, they have the same rights. That's just simply not true. It's not even true at a formal level. And you can see it most clearly in a distinction Israel makes between 
uh, citizenship and nationality. So all, all the people we're talking about, the, the, you, you gave us the figures, 20% of the population are Palestinians inside Israel, the rest are, are mainly Jews. Um, all of those people are citizens. They all have citizenship, they all have passports and so on. But it doesn't mean they have exactly the same status. <clears throat> Israel also creates this other status called nationality. So before I went to Israel, I didn't really get this at all. I'm an Israeli, a British citizen, I'm a British national, you know, I, I just thought those were synonymous terms. But in Israel, they have entirely different meanings. So although everybody's an Israeli citizen, they have different national statuses. In fact, there are more than 130 different nationalities recognized inside Israel. But the, the important one, the one that you would really need to have equality is a nationality of Israeli. But there is no Israeli nationality. Israel does not recognize its own nationality. Instead, most, Palest uh, it, sorry, most Israeli citizens are recognized as Jewish or Arab uh, as nationals, rather. Now, there are, as I said, there are 130, there are a lot more. When I, I'm an Israeli citizen, I got my, my citizenship, but I, I have my own distinct nationality, or a small group of us do. I'm, a, I'm an Israeli citizen with British nationality. My wife is an Israeli citizen with Arab nationality, as are my children. So they, this nationality is actually very, very important. You derive a lot of rights in Israel, from, not from your citizenship, but from your nationality. And in fact, Israel creates different kinds of rights based on whether they're citizenship rights or national rights. Now, some of the things that we might look at and say they look fairly equal tend to be the citizenship rights. I'm not going to argue they, that you get equal rights just because they're citizenship rights. In practice, that's not true. But if we look at, as we've talked about already, education, education is an example primarily of a citizenship right. But as we've also seen, it's subverted by this principle that Israel segregates uh, where people go to school based on where they live. So in practice, it's not really equal. You can see this also with health. Uh, healthcare is actually probably the best example you have of Israel of equal rights. There aren't equal rights, but it's the best you can find of it. If you look to communities down in the Negev, and we haven't spoken about unrecognized villages yet, but the Bedouin communities, they're, they're almost a tenth of the population in Israel. They're denied all services. They're not allowed anything, electricity, water, and so on. And they don't certainly don't have health clinics or health care there. So if you're a Palestinian living in one of these un unrecognized villages, you don't get medical care. You have to travel. Well, you do get medical care, but you just don't get it anywhere near where you live. So you have to travel huge distances. Um, you've got segregated maternity wards. Well, this is one of the things the Israeli media um, divulged not so long ago. Everybody assumed that there wasn't this kind of segregation, but eventually it was admitted that there is, that they have maternity wards for Arab citizens, Palestinian citizens, they have different maternity wards for Jewish citizens. So there's still a lot of segregation going on and there's still a lot of inequality going on based even in healthcare, but it is still essentially a citizenship right. You get that. And voting would be another example of a citizenship right. But there are also lots of national rights where there is a lot of segregation. I mean, it's inherent that there's segregation in these national rights because there is only one nationality that gets these kinds of national rights. And those are the Jewish population. You don't get Jonathan, Arab national Jonathan, rights. Jonathan, just to summarize what I think I hear you saying is mm. to take education, that to have free education K-12 to is a citizen right. Yeah. But to have good education is a national right. It, it's that Jews get access to good education and you're not Jewish, you don't. Is that really what you're saying? Well, in practice, yes. I mean, that's not obviously the way, the way it says it in the laws, but what happens is that where you, it, it, what's determined is where you go to school is going to be determined where you live. And so if you're living in inferior communities, uh, Israel would, for instance, Israel has something called the national priority areas where you get more funding for education. There are 550 national priority areas in Israel and of them, even though Palestinians are 20% of the population, four of them are Palestinian communities. And they're not big communities like Nazareth, significant ones. They're tiny little hamlets with you know, five or six families living there. And Israel has only allowed those four communities to get that national priority area status twice so that people like me can't say only Jews are in the national priority areas because there are you know, half a dozen Palestinian families who are also in it but that it has no practical effect. It's, that's just another bit of window dressing so that it becomes harder to say it's strictly segregated. There are a few examples, but in practice, all the money's being funneled towards Jewish communities, and, and that's would, including would, the schools. What would pre prevent um, a Palestinian with certain means, Palestinian, like a doctor, from moving into one of those Jewish communities and having his kids go to school there? 
so here, well, here we get to the nub of, of what I would say that why people are calling this apartheid, because what you're getting here with the national rights, you're getting the key resources of the state are being res restricted to the Jewish population. And one of the most important of those resources is land. So Israel has nationalized 93% of the land in Israel. And most people, when they hear that, they think, well, OK, but that's nationalized for the nation, for, the, for, for, every, for Israeli citizens, without understanding that it's nationalized for the Jewish nation, not for Israel, because there's no Israeli nationality, as I was saying before. So it's not, when it's nationalized, that all that land is nationalized, it's actually being nationalized, not even for Israeli Jews, for Jews all around the world. So actually, Jews living abroad in America or Canada have more rights to the land in Israel than Israeli citizens who are Palestinian. Do. So my wife has less of a right than a, a Jew in Brooklyn who's never visited um, because of this nationalization of the land for Jewish citizens. So what Israel does is it, it nationalizes huge swathes of the land, almost all of it, and then it builds communities on this land. And it's built hundreds of them, of course, since uh, many hundreds of them since 1948. And then it creates something called an admissions committee for each one. And the admissions committee is a vetting committee. committee. And so if you want to go and live in that community, you have to pass this vetting committee and it's Jewish Zionist officials for, from agencies like the Jewish National Fund and the Jewish Agency. They get to decide whether you're going to be allowed to live in this community. Now, it doesn't say, because Israel is very careful about its image, it doesn't say Palestinian citizens of Israel cannot live in these hundreds and hundreds of communities on most of the land in Israel. It doesn't say that because that would be obviously ra racist. So what happens instead is there's an admissions committee law, it was passed, I mean, this has always been true, but it, they, actually it was formalized into a law in 2011 because groups like Adala were challenging this practice. So we have a law now that says this, and it says that you have to, the, the vetting committee, the admissions committee has to decide that you are socially suitable to live in that community. And now we know what socially suitable means because we see it in practice. What does it mean? It means you have to be a, a, a Zionist Jew. You have to be somebody who fits in with that community. And if you're a Palestinian citizen of Israel, you never fit in. You never pass that vetting procedure. So there are no Palestinian citizens of Israel living in these hundreds and hundreds of communities all across Israel, dominating almost all of the land in Israel. It's off limits to them. So instead, Palestinian citizens of Israel are trapped into ghettos. There's another law. Israel has lots of these kinds of law, like the planning and building law from 1965, which recognizes 120 Palestinian communities. Israel hasn't built another one in all, all its years. It's not built one new Palestinian community. And what this planning and building law does is it draws a blue line around each community, Palestinian community in Israel, and it then cannot expand beyond that limit. It does this with Jewish communities as well. But what it did over the years is it, it, it drew broad lines around Jewish communities. So they had a growth room over the years they could grow and expand. And sometimes they're amended so they can grow more. But when it's a Palestinian community, the blue line was drawn in 1965, and it's barely changed in any of those communities ever since. So they're, they're trapped, they're ghettoized, and they, can, they cannot expand outwards. And so what happens is these communities get choked. So you've got most of the land you can't access as a Palestinian citizen, citizen of Israel, and your own communities, you can't build new properties. There are tens of thousands of homes in, in Palestinian communities, in, just in the Galilee, where I was, up in the north of Israel which are illegal, defined as illegal, and they have demolition orders. And you'll hear Israeli Jews saying, why do Palestinians build illegally? Well, nobody builds an illegal home if you can build a legal one, because you're paying off enormous fines and there's a threat your home is going to be demolished at the end of it. Nobody's going to do that. You have to be insane to do that. They're not, tens of thousands of families aren't doing that just to be difficult. They're doing it because they have literally no other option. There's no other way they can live. You know, if you're a young family, unless you're going to just all live generation after generation after generation in the same small home together, you have to build illegally. And that's what families do. The same problem, of course, in, in East Jerusalem. Everybody knows the story in East Jerusalem. It's more familiar. But it's exactly the same story inside Israel as well. So these houses, families are living in terrible conditions, overcrowded communities, not properly rigged up to electricity services in many cases and so on. People taking wires off other people's homes because they can't get planning permission. There are no master plans in most of the Palestinian communities inside Israel. Housing, planning, residential issues are a disaster for Palestinians inside Israel and always have been for decades and decades. And that's a very good example of the consequences of a national right, which privileges Jews, hundreds of communities built for Jews, land everywhere, easy to go and move anywhere you want to. You can choose 
you could, as I used to say when I was living in Nazareth, that we were surrounded by, by hundreds of these cooperative communities up in the Galilee. And you could choose any kind of community you wanted to go and live in. You could, you could go and uh, find a community that everybody's a vegan or everybody does yoga or your child is great at ballet. I once stumbled into one, everybody does ballet. You have to have a child who does ballet to go and live in that community. Um, there are all these options, lifestyle choices you can make if you're a Jewish citizen. If you're a Palestinian citizen, where you're born is almost certainly where you're going to die because there's going to be no other options for you in the, in, in the, in the, in the, in the state. And so Palestinians are choked all the time. And it leads to all sorts of other consequences. This segregated residential living leads to the consequences of segregated education. Uh, it means you don't have access to industrial areas. Those industrial areas are all built in Jewish communities. So you don't, it's very hard to find jobs. Um, there are lots and lots of different ways this filters through to the problems for Palestinians inside Israel. And it's all rooted in, in this issue of land and where you can live inside Israel. So I could spend all day talking about this. There's so many different ways that it impacts. I won't, I won't let you spoke, speak on no, that. I'm going to change, change the topic a little bit about um, employment. What, one of the arguments that I've heard uh, used sometimes in some webinars recently is um, um, in the health system in particular, there are a, a lot of Palestinian doctors, nurses, um, physiotherapists, uh, pharmacists, and so on. And um, isn't that um, some kind of demonstration of um, equality of access, quality of, of, I believe they're far overrepresented with respect to their percentage in the population. So um, what, what, do you, what do you make of this? Well, you could actually see it exactly the opposite way. I know this might be counterintuitive to most people, but actually it's sort of evidence of the discrimination. One of the reasons you find so many Palestinians, are we talking about elite here? Let's not suggest that most Palestinians are doctors and lawyers and pharmacists. Of course not. Um, but the elite of Palestinian society, and many of them are based in cities like the one I was, I was living in, Nazareth, um, where because of its historical connection to the churches, you have a very good private school system. So you can opt out of, it's one of the few places in Israel where you can opt out of the terrible state schools. You can go and get yourself into a nice church school. And there are about a dozen of them in Nazareth. And they are very, very good schools. Um, so if you if you if you go through that school system, you're more likely to get to a university inside Israel, uh, which in itself is going to be difficult. But you're, you, that gives you a better chance of doing it. And you're more likely to get a qualification, a professional qualification. So that small elite in Palestinian society, they end up becoming doctors, pharmacists, lawyers, typically. But and so people say, well, isn't that an example that everything's fine there and it's actually really equal society? No, it's actually evidence of the discrimination, because if you're, a Palest if you're a successful Palestinian citizen, young Palestinian citizen, and you manage to get to university because of all these other privileges you've got, pretty much the only thing you can do is become a doctor, lawyer or pharmacist. Those are the only parts of the, the lawyer. The, 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 lawyer. Yeah, I just said lawyer, doctor, lawyer yeah. uh, and, and pharmacist, because the rest of the, the employment system is pretty much. And now also Israel recently has started to open high parts of the high tech industries up, not a lot of it, but some of it to Palestinians inside Israel. So to see a bit of that as well. But much of the economy is actually off limits. Anything Israel defines as security related is off limits. Now you might think, well, that, what's that? That's like being you know, a career officer in the army or building weapons uh, in the Raphael armaments industry and so on. Yes, of course, those things are off limits to Palestinian citizens of Israel. But actually security, lots of the sections of the economy are considered to be um, security related, for instance, being a pilot in work. You, and you see a lot of these court cases coming up where Palestinian citizens try and challenge this and you'll see in Har, it's a newspaper covering it. Uh, Palestinian citizens trying to become pilots, uh, civilian pilots in the El Al or something. No chance. Doesn't happen. They're not allowed to do that. You want to be an engineer? No chance. Because if you're to if, think about what is an engineer going to be doing in Israel? Well, they're going to be constructing various things. It might be power lines or uh, water systems or road connections. And where are all of these connecting up to? They're connecting up to the settlements. That's where ultimately, I mean, this is Israel and the occupied territories aren't separate. There are different systems here from Israel's point of view. There are if you're a Palestinian, but if you're Israel, it's all integrated together. So the roads go from Jewish cities inside Israel to Jewish settlements inside the occupied territories and the water systems and the electricity pylons and the mobile phones and all the rest of it. So all of these industries are considered security industries. And so the electricity, uh, there's a huge national electricity uh, utility 
which employs, I think the last time I looked, something like 14,000 people. And of them, about six, five, six are Palestinian citizens of Israel. Same with the telecommunications company, Bezek, National Telecommunications Company, which employs about 10, 11,000 people. About four of them are Palestinian citizens of Israel. There's an interesting story why they exist at all, which is to do with the Oslo process and a promise that Yitzhak Rabin made to the Americans, which was quickly dumped uh, after they, they got what they wanted. But so you have huge swathes of the economy are simply off limits to successful Palestinians. And so if they're going to succeed, the way that they see, succeed is by becoming doctors, lawyers and pharmacists. And partly that's because you have, as I said, healthcare is one of the the few areas where the discrimination isn't really rampant and in deeply entrenched, although there it, it exists. And so um, you need Palestinian doctors. If you're if 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 you're a Palestinian in Nazareth and you need to go and see your GP, you need somebody probably who can speak Arabic to you. And so the healthcare system recognizes that fact. It needs doctors who can speak Arabic to deal with those those patients. Uh, if you're a Palestinian and you need representation in court, you want a lawyer who you can speak Arabic to. So it, it actually works for Israel and keeps it, it oils the wheels of how the system works. But those are actually the very narrow limits in which Palestinians can be reasonably successful. So I would argue it's actually evidence that of the discrimination. And maybe just to make a parallel that might strike home with some people, if one were to look at um, Jews living in Europe 100 years ago, and we know that uh, Europe was extremely anti-Semitic towards Jews in that period, but look at the number of Jews who were doctors, lawyers, and so on. I mean, they, they, what Jews did in Europe, racist Europe 100 years ago, was seek some kind of communal protection and family protection by trying to get into professions where they, in some sense, controlled their own destiny, the best they could do in terms of controlling their own destiny, when so much of the rest of European industries and so on were off limits to them. So actually what Palestinians are doing is a sort of echo of what Jews did to try and protect themselves from racism 100 years ago. Uh, to me, it's the evidence of the racism. It's a signal of it. Not, not. Uh, uh, it doesn't re refute it in any way. Jonathan, given all these um, difficulties, uh, we're still stuck with this statement that I assume is true that uh, public opinion surveys show that Palestinian citizens of Israel, um, for all its uh, shortcomings, would prefer to live in Israel than to live in certainly in the West Bank, than to live in Jordan or live in Egypt or whatever. So maybe life isn't that bad after all. How do you interpret that? Well, in, in a sense, it's a strange way to look at it because this is, after all, their homeland. People who, my wife, her, her parents, her grandparents, her great-grandparents, her great-great-grandparents were from Nazareth. Nazareth has a huge significance to my wife and her family. Um, as well as it does, of course, to Christians around the world. But it, it has that and much more going for it. In this, people feel very deeply connected to the places they, they live. The idea they can just up stumps and move somewhere else, as though that, that would mean nothing to them, I think is, shows a, a, a sort of insensitivity to, the, to, to those connections that people feel very strongly. Um, I mean, how, how would we feel if we were saying to Ukrainians right now, well, things are tough right now, you know, you're, you're under attack from Russia. Why don't you just go and live in France or Spain? People are doing that because they have no choice because there's a war going on. But we would, most of us wouldn't think Ukrainians would just choose to do that. Think, well, yeah, maybe I'll just go and live in Poland. It's just the same as living in Ukraine. We'll go and live in Britain or anywhere else. That will be a huge wrench for them to leave their homeland. Why would it be any different for Palestinians to leave their homeland? It's exactly the same for them. Plus, in many ways, for Palestinians, actually, there's even more than would be at stake for you or me moving. Most of us in the West are raised in nuclear families. We're a small family, we have parents, and we go off to university if we're lucky. And then the end of that, we think, well, I'll go somewhere different. My parents, you know, I was raised in this community. I'll go to university somewhere else. I want to be a bit independent and find my own life and so on. And I'll set up my home somewhere else. Or I might marry somebody and they come from somewhere else. And it's a, it's a lottery where we end up in, in your case, Canada, in my case, Britain, and so on. But that's not really the way Palestinian society is. And most traditional societies, most of the world don't live that way. They are connected very much to the lands that they live in. Um, they're rooted in traditions, in culture, in language. I mean, I just know that you could go just a few miles down the road from Nazareth 
and people are speaking a very different kind of Arabic with very different accents and dialects and words and so on. So people are very connected to where they live and it, it gives them a, a sense of uh, their identity, their culture, their heritage. And that's very important to them in a way maybe we've partly jettisoned in Western liberal democracies. We tend to be a bit more casual about these things, but we shouldn't project that onto other people and think that they feel exactly the same way about it. Uh, it's one of the reasons why Palestinians talk a great deal. They use this terminology of sumud, steadfastness, because, because being rooted in the land, this idea of being rooted where you are, is very important to them. It, it gives them that whole sense of identity. And I don't think we should trivialize that, just make out like they could just uproot and go anywhere else. And it, when people talk about that in terms of why don't they go to Egypt, it's to assume that Egypt is the same as Palestine. And we wouldn't say Britain's the same as, as Germany or Poland's the same as Spain. Um, but the, the, just because they, they, they speak a, a, a similar language, we can't even say it's the same language, we shouldn't mis start making the mistake of thinking that, that these are essentially the same places. They're not, they're very different. Jonathan, um, I, a couple of people have asked questions about the status of Arabic in, the, uh, in, um, in Israel. There's something that Canadians are sensitive to. We, we have a 20% minority uh, French speaking population. Uh, we have made um, many accommodations to that. Canada is officially a bilingual country. Um, all the debates in Parliament, all government documents um, are available in both languages, even in some areas where it seems a little bit far-fetched, like in Vancouver or whatever, where there are hardly any uh, French-speaking uh, children, although my, my grandchildren actually go to a French school in Vancouver. Um, we know that uh, Israel um, passed this nation state law that the, that the uh, Arabic language I think was official and now isn't. What, what's, this, what's the official status and what's the practical status of uh, Arabic uh, in Israel today? Okay, so, well, the reason that is Arabic is an official language is, is a relic of the British mandate. So when the British mandate was there, they created three languages as official languages, English, Arabic, and Hebrew. So Arabic had that status as an official language and Israel never... Um, never revoked that status. So historically it had official, it was an official language, but in practice, it wasn't recognized as one. And we're back really to this distinction between citizenship rights and national rights. Language is considered a national right and only Jews have that national right to a, to a language. So in, in fact, this has been tested. So you, you'll see, and there are stories again in, in liberal publications like Haaretz, which, which worry more about this. The, the liberal elements in Isra Israeli Jewish society worry about this. They feel like language is, you know, you can't even make the concession of allowing Arabic to have that kind of status where it's equal with, with the Jewish language, Hebrew language. Um, so if you go into museums inside Israel, or you go into national institutions, or you're in the courts, pretty much everything's in Hebrew. It's quite unusual to see Arabic. Um, and there have been surveys done of this. You know, Haaretz did one a few years ago where they went into all the national in, uh, um, museums in Israel to see what proportion of them were, were putting up signs in Arabic. And it was a tiny proportion of them. Well, hold on um, for a second. Hold on for a second, because hmm. I've arrived at Ben Gurion Airport. I do see signs in uh, Hebrew. I see signs on the highway going from uh, Ben Gurion to uh, Jerusalem. Um, here, yeah. Here's... So I was I was literally I was just literally about to say so. Here's a good example. So you see them on the road signs. Why do you see them on the road signs? This has been tested. You don't see them actually on all road signs. You see them on the main highways. You don't see them in the smaller areas, but you do see them on the main highways, the Arabic language and the Hebrew language. So why is that? Well, this has been tested. It, examples where you don't see it, uh, groups like Adala, the, the Palestinian legal group inside Israel, have taken this to the courts, arguing that Arabic must be recognized as a national language, as an official, because it has official status it must be recognized uh, as, a, a, as a right of Palestinian citizens of Israel to have their language represented in all aspects of life, including on um, what, what we'd call minority language rights as a, as a status, which Israel would think of more as national rights to a language, recognition of their language. And in the case of traffic signs, the courts have ruled that the Palestinian minority has no language rights, national language rights. So why is the language, why is Arabic on the traffic signs? For one reason only, safety. The courts have accepted it should be there because it might be dangerous if, if Palestinian citizens of Israel don't have good Hebrew, they may be struggling to read the sign and while they're doing that might crash. 
So that's the reason you see the language on the signs, not because it's recognizing their language as their language, as having a right to their language. It's there purely for safety, practical safety concerns. That's that's the ruling of the, the Israeli Supreme Court when this was tested in the courts. Um, but as, as I was also going to say, the, 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 the nation state law 2018 did change because it wanted to downgrade Arabic from an official language, it, it, which in practice it isn't anyway. It's, it's not treated as an official language, but it wanted that formalized. It's now given the status of a special language. But what the meaning of that is, has been left open. So it's totally unclear. It's special. It, it seems to be a sop to the courts to, because there was the danger that if it, it had been stripped of any status, it would have been challenged in the courts. And the courts might have felt in those circumstances that they wanted to declare it to be a national right for the Palestinian minority to have their own language, language rights, which they've never done, they've never conceded. So it seems to be more an effort to, to preempt that, make sure it doesn't happen by saying it's a special language, but actually that has no content whatsoever. It's not actually gonna mean, mean anything. The other thing I'll just briefly say about language is that it's very familiar, even in the Israeli media it covers this quite regularly, that it's quite difficult for Palestinians to use their own language um, in public. And there are many attacks on Palestinians when they're identified as Arabs, because it's not always obvious. You know, if you're a Jew from the, the Arab world, what the Mizrahi Jews as you refer to them, um, it's not obvious always whether somebody's a Palestinian citizen of Israel or a Mizrahi Jew. But if people are speaking Arabic in public areas, they have been attacked on many occasions. So there's a certain fear of speaking Arabic, even in public spaces. And just to give an example that was in the Israeli media just the other day, uh, two students at Hebrew University in Jerusalem who were speaking in Arabic. Uh, there are many of the, the students uh, in places like Hebrew University are there on special scholarships because they're serving in the police or the army. These, there were uh, three or four students who were walking past them who were on a, a police scholarship. So these were Israeli Jews who were in the police force but doing a, a course at uh, the university, um, stopped them and arrested them and then called for their colleagues in the police force to come and they were bundled into the police car and taken down for interrogation because they were speaking Arabic and the police officers didn't like the fact they weren't clear what they were saying. So they just arrested them. Um, so there are risks entailed for any Palestinian citizen of Israel in speaking your own language in public spaces. You can't quite know where that might lead you. We've had a little tiny sniff of that in Canada some time ago when the uh, tensions between Quebec nationalists and Canada were strong. There were people claiming that French-speaking people should speak white. Uh, there had a little little tiny bit of that. I yeah. do remember, Jonathan, we're going to have to move to winding up here. So you, the, time is, the time is up. I'm going to ask in a second. I'm going to ask our secretary to um, share a screen for a moment before we give you thanks. But a little anecdote that might be of interest to Canadians. I, I've taken many groups to the Knesset. And in the Knesset, um, I was asking our guide if there is translation because there are Arab members in the Knesset. And um, oh, I didn't tell her why I was asking the question. I asked if there was translation in the Knesset and she assured me that there was translation, but it was only every time foreign visitors come to visit uh, Israel, then they get translated from Polish or Greek or whatever, but there's no translation available. And then I quiz her, are you to Palestinian members of the Knesset, do they have the right to speak in Arabic? They do have the right to speak in Arabic, but nobody understands them. So it doesn't really uh, do very much. And all government documents, committee documents, and so on, I was told, are in Hebrew only. Jonathan, I'm going to ask you to hold on just for a second. I want to just flip to um, a couple of things about what's what's upcoming. And I'm going to come back and thank you appropriately. If you wouldn't mind just bearing with us. Can sure. you share screen there, please? Um, so first of all, I want to remind people that OFIP is voluntary and self-financed. Uh, any do donations will be gratefully accepted by sending an e-transfer to this address. I will be sending out a follow-up email with a link to this re the registration of this. And if you're able to give us some help with this, uh, we put the these on for free, but they do cost us a certain amount of, of money and we appreciate any support we can get. Second slide. Um, oh, I should also mention that uh, that will include a small honorarium to Jonathan, who lives by his uh, education and by his wits, and we're very happy to offer him um, a contribution for his performance, uh, to, for his educational performance today. Our next uh, um, slide, next uh, uh, webinar is on the NACPA, uh, and I think you'll find that very interesting. You will be getting a promotional material about that. And finally, 
we have one more thing. Oh, yes. If you want to learn more about us, you can go to www.ottawaforumip.org. That's our website. Or listen uh, or subscribe to uh, our blog, a weekly blog at canadatalksisraelpalestine.ca. This information will all be sent to you. Okay, we can come away from the that. You can end the share screen. Um, Jonathan, it's 4.15 my time, which makes it, I think, 9.15 your time, which is exactly the time that we wanted to wind up. There were still lots of questions. I'm sorry we couldn't um, deal with them all, but I think you've all, uh, your, your knowledge um, is not only theoretical, but practical by virtue of living in Nazareth, having a Palestinian citizen as a wife, uh, your ki kids start to go through school and see the challenges they face. So I think you bring a lot of texture to your, your presentation. Um, you, I, I felt I had, had to jump in and cut you off several times because you have so much information that my head is swimming. But uh, we dealt with uh, some of the questions and perhaps we'll have an, another opportunity going forward to deal with them. Jonathan, on behalf of all of us, thank you so much for your presentation today. Thank you, Peter. It's been a pleasure. And uh, to everybody, have a good day. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye-bye.